Hello and welcome to lecture three covering nutrition and metabolism. The main idea of this lecture will be to cover cellular respiration, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the ETC. We'll begin with the just general definition of metabolism, the sum total of all chemical reactions in the body. Now if you think about what can happen metabolically, what can go on in a chemical reaction, you come to two basic conclusions. There are catabolic reactions in which a larger substance is broken down into smaller ones. And in this reaction, you release energy during this process. This is what cell respiration is. We start with the breakdown of glucose, and we end with production of adenosine triphosphate, ultimately after we run through all the steps. The opposite of that is an anabolic reaction. And this is where you build something up. You need energy to run this one. So the energy released from catabolic reactions is what drives anabolic reactions. And the two are ongoing in the body. An anabolic reaction would be like building a protein or something like that. So energy is released here. Energy is used here. This is a breakdown. This is a buildup. You can always remember this one because anabolic steroids build people up. So anabolic is a buildup. and kind of help you there. Oxidation and reduction are two terms used in chemistry. When a chemical is oxidized, it has lost something. When it is reduced, it has gained something. And that really messes with people's minds a little bit, that reduction is a gain. So if I add a phosphate group onto chemical X, I will say that chemical X has been reduced because it has gained something extra. When we talk about cell respiration, we're gonna use this main pathway. Carbohydrates get broken down in your digestive system into glucose. Glucose is what runs glycolysis, and then the production in glycolysis, pyruvate, gets converted into acetyl-CoA, and that runs the Krebs cycle, and the stuff in the Krebs cycle runs the ETC. So this is the traditional pathway. However, I do want you to take note that what if I cut carbs out of my diet? Well, the number two source of energy is right here fats. This is kind of the basis behind Atkins diet. If you can cut this out, you will burn this. These are the two building blocks of a lipid, and you can use them, as you can see here, to enter into cell respiration with the ultimate goal of making ATP. So we can burn these for energy. This is kind of our rainy day fun for energy. Let's say you don't have enough, you want some quicker energy during the day. What's healthy to eat besides carbs? Proteins. Now, proteins are conserved by the body. We want to use these to get amino acids so that we can build our own hair and hemoglobin and other structures in our body. However, if you have an excess of proteins, you can use proteins in three different places infrequently to run cell respiration and make ATP. So you can make energy using any of these things. This is just the number one way, and this is the way we'll kind of stick to. But if you didn't get any carbs in today, don't worry, you'll make plenty of energy. If you didn't get any fat, eh, you got proteins. If you were like to stop eating today, you'd burn your carbs and then your fat, and then your body would basically start eating its muscles. You'd get very weak from this, but you'd live quite a long time without food, as long as you have water. Cell respiration here is a decent little overview of it. You've got glycolysis and where it occurs. You've got the Krebs cycle and where it occurs in this blue area called the mitochondrial matrix. The electron transport chain, oxidative phosphorylation, occurs on these little fingers, these little membranes. This is the inner membrane of the mitochondria. This is the outer membrane. The electron transport chains are on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So you got where they occur here. You see this water spigot coming out. The end product of this reaction is water because the oxygen accepts electrons, water is produced. We'll get to that in a minute. The chemical energy thing you see here is actually NADH, FADH2, electron carriers. You see high energy electrons here. A little smokestack chugging out CO2. This is where most of the carbon dioxide production comes from. So you may have a few hundred mitochondria in one cell. You know, several trillion cells in your body, let's say 70, 80 trillion or more. That's a lot of mitochondria, and that's a lot of Krebs cycles, and that's a lot of CO2, and we breathe that out. This is a waste product. So all that CO2 that comes out with every breath is coming from these reactions. 
Likewise, the oxygen you breathe in is accepting electrons and being turned into water. So your mitochondria and your cells are basically turning your oxygen into water. This little guy right here explains why you breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2. So pretty good little overview. And we'll go over each of these three steps. This is the Krebs cycle. It looks pretty complicated. Citrate, isocitrate, alpha ketoglutarate, succinyl coenzyme A, succinate, fumarate, malate, bactoxylacate. You will not have to remember any of those. What you will need to know about the Krebs cycle is very basic. And one, that it's a cycle. It's eight steps. And what's running all of these steps are enzymes. So it's an enzyme that will take acetyl-CoA, this little two-carbon molecule, and oxaloacetate, this four carbon molecule, and stick the two together to make this six carbon molecule, four plus two equals six, citrate. So an enzyme grabs this, grabs this, pops them together, that makes this. And you'll knock off the water and make this, and you'll add some NADH on, knock off some CO2, and this will turn into this. And you don't have to memorize the details, but if you follow the reaction, it starts here, ends here. So this is a cycle in the mitochondrial matrix, 8-enzyme-assisted pathway. We'll cover it just a little bit later. You also see the transitional period. In glycolysis that's in the cytosol, you made glucose turn into pyruvic acid or pyruvate. That will enter the mitochondria through a little transport protein and get converted into acetyl-CoA. See, this one has three carbons. This one has two. You knock a carbon off. And there it goes. There's another CO2. So all that CO2 is coming from this mitochondria. If we take a look at our ETC, well, we'll do that in a second. Let's review what we've got right here. If you look at just the Krebs cycle alone, you see one, two, three NADH molecules. These are our electron carriers. You can take this NADH and turn it back into NAD+. Plus strip out the electrons and that gives you positive NAD plus and positive hydrogens. So that's what this molecule does. But there's three here, but this cycle runs twice because in glycolysis I will make two pyruvates. So double it and what I'll say in your notes is that the Krebs cycle made six NADH, two FADH2s, two ATPs, and four CO2s. So take what you see here and just double it, and that'll be your final numbers for your products. The electron transport chain, a little harder to explain. I'll go over it in full detail here, but you'll see it better in the notes a little bit later. The electron carriers you made in ADH and FADH2 back in the Krebs cycle and glycolysis can donate these electrons. See them converting to NAD+. The electrons are pumped down a chain of proteins and electron transport chain. It's transporting electrons. Well, the energy in this moving charged particle causes these little proteins to turn on. And what they are is proton pumps. They'll pump this H pluses that you get released from splitting this up inside to the inner membrane space of the mitochondria. So they'll basically pump it from, say I'm sitting right here, from right here into the space, so into this area around the outside in between those fingers, trapping that hydrogen in between the outer membrane and the inner membrane, creating a concentration gradient. So you're pumping into the inner membrane space all these hydrogen. Well, hydrogen's positive. It can't flow back out. So what you've created is a really positive region and a really negative region because you're pumping all your H pluses over here. Well, you know opposites attract and the H pluses have to flow out from high to low. They flow out an enzyme called ATP synthase. This is another moving charged particle. And as this thing moves through, it actually goes through a corner right here. It actually spins. This thing acts like a little turbine. Now down here, what you don't see is there's a binding site on this enzyme for an ADP and a phosphate group. As the H's move through, this enzyme will stick the phosphate onto the ADP, creating ATP. So it's like water behind a dam. You pumped in a bunch of water, you let it flow out this little turbine, and it generated a bunch of ATP. A very heavily studied protein here. And it's called chemiosmosis. 
But picture it just like trapped water flowing out from behind the dam and it's spinning a turbine and creating energy. That's kind of what's happening. So what happens to the electron? This electron's moving through from protein to protein like cytochrome C here. And it eventually, by this protein here, an enzyme, is added on to a couple of these free H pluses and an oxygen molecule. So we say oxygen an O, not O2, just one of the O's. It gets split right here. One of the O's, one half of O2, is the final electron acceptor of the ETC. This is why you breathe. To accept electrons that these electron carriers have given up, that you stored by breaking down glucose at the ends of these little proteins. And ETCs line these membranes. I mean, there would be millions of them inside one mitochondria. They'd be all over this. It's not just one set of proteins. And when you add the negatives on to the oxygen, and you got positive hydrogen floating around, the opposites attract, and what this enzyme ultimately does is add the electrons on, six some H's on, and you make water. Which is why you've seen that water spigot coming out a little earlier. Back on this slide. See the water coming out? That's what they're trying to basically show you there, is that you make water out of this. So donate electrons, use that energy to pump hydrogen, hydrogen flow out ATP synthase. That makes ATP by far the most right here. 34 of the possible 38 generated by this enzyme. So this is our big ATP producer. What you were doing in glycolysis and Krebs was basically making electron carriers to donate electrons here to run this process. And it's called oxidative phosphorylation because it's running off of oxygen, what's driving the electrons, what accepts them so that you can put new ones in? Oxygen. The reason you breathe, literally. Take a look at the little proton pump. You see the ETC pumps H pluses. They flow out the ATP synthase. That generates ATP. What's driving the flow? Oxygen. So this is only running in the presence of oxygen. Oxidative phosphorylation. Great overview here with numbers. So glycolysis, you put in glucose, you get out pyruvate, you make two in ADH, two pyruvates, two ATPs. Pyruvic acid or pyruvate enters the mitochondria, is converted to acetyl-CoA. You make a couple of NADH there and some CO2. That's what's not shown. You can get two CO2s here. The Krebs cycle runs twice, two acetyl-CoAs, so you get a total of six NADH two FADH2s, two ATPs, and once again, you have to write it in, four CO2s. And the electron transport chain is where most of our energy is going to be generated. What they're showing you here is 28 and 32. Um, that is for the simplest cell. Some cells make 34, some 36, some 38. So this is kind of the low ball count here. Uh, I usually go with the highest possible which is the 38 number, if you add that one up. So after you've got this general overview, I've put together some slides here that cover the basics. This is what I would expect on an exam. You can go back and look at the pictures and review this as well. Glycolysis, where does it occur in the cytosol? What is it? A series of 10 enzyme-assisted reactions that break down glucose into pyruvate. What do you make? Two, two, and two. All right. Minimum for an exam for telling me about glycolysis. These come back to you as fill in the blank questions. Okay. Um, keep in mind, prove a pruvic acid. I always say prove a, but they're the same thing. Just like citrate, citric acid, same thing. And prove a enters the mitochondria, gets converted to acetyl CoA. You make that NADH there and another CO2. So this is kind of an in-between or transition step from, from out here in the cytosol to in here. That's this step right here, moving here to here that you see there. And then glycolysis can be ran anaerobically without oxygen. So we do a fermentation pathway where we ultimately make lactic acid. You only make two ATPs for every glucose. So what you ultimately really do is you burn calories way faster doing anaerobic exercises. You know, if you were to do, oh, five push-ups and then jump up and touch the ceiling and then 
down and five more, and then jump up and touch, and then down and five more. Do that as fast as you can, as hard as you can for three minutes. That would be anaerobic, and you would burn a ton of calories. But you're also going to end up with a byproduct of lactic acid, meaning from this reaction, you would fatigue. Lactic acid would make you tired where you couldn't do that anymore. You know, I can walk all day. I, I cannot do five push-ups, jump up to my feet, jump up, touch the ceiling, jump back down, do five, jump up, jump back down, do five, jump up, jump back down, do five, all day. You know, a matter of minutes, and you can't do it anymore. So that's anaerobic exercise, but you burn way more calories that way. That's the basis behind these workouts like P90X and Insanity, where you do this really intense, high-calorie burning exercises. And you end up burning more calories in a 45-minute workout than you would if you were, you know, walking for the entire day, basically. So there's some, you know, knowledge use that you can go with glycolysis to think about exercise in terms of that. And lactic acid also tends to make you sore. So that's usually the part you don't really like that breaks down muscles. So basics of the Krebs. Where does it occur? Mitochondrial matrix. What is it? Series of eight enzyme-assisted chemical reactions. So this is the details here. All right, series of eight. It runs as a cycle, beginning and ending, with the same molecule oxaloacetate products in bold I gave you after two trips through now 6NADH, 2FADH2, 2 ATPs, 4 co 2s Example of a question the Krebs cycle occurs in the blank and it is a series of blank enzyme assisted reactions or a series of eight blank assisted reactions either way I want to do it could put the blanks anywhere and I could say it produces six blank, uh, blank FADH2, blank A. So the blanks can be in the numbers or right here, but it's a pretty big question. You need to know this stuff. And the basics of the ETC, what is it and where? It's proteins embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. How does it work? Strips electrons from the electron carriers made in glycolysis and Krebs. That's in ADH and FADH2. It's going to use them to drive the formation. I have to get rid of that extra Z there. Of up to 34 ATPs via oxidative, running off oxygen, right? Phosphorylation. Oxygen's our final electron acceptor. That's its job. And it's converted into water, the end product. This is where most, by far, of the ATP is made. And that is the basics of... ETC, Krebs cycle, and glycolysis. Collectively, glycolysis, Krebs, and ETC is just called cellular respiration.